Okay, we're rolling. Good. Okay, this is all about cake. Comprehensive queue management made easy. And the first thing that I'd like to point out, since we have heard from lots of you about all these mesh protocols that you've been working on, is that cake is not a mesh protocol. Just want to make that clear up front. <laughs> so no disappointments. It's a queue discipline, which you might also know as active queue management. So you can use it with whichever mesh protocol you like, or even with standard static routing, as you normally see on the internet these days. Cake does not care about that. It doesn't care about a lot of things. Now, Cake is not specialized for any particular use case, but it's designed mostly with the edge of the network in mind. So it has some functionality for ADSL and cable and fiber. It's generally tuned for internet scale latencies. So around 100 milliseconds, give or take an order of magnitude. But although it's not specialized for Wi-Fi or local area networks, it'll work there anyway. Perfectly fine but probably the only place it doesn't work optimally is in the data center, but none of us live in a data center. Now, what we've got today is FQ Codel, and that's in the Linux kernel mainline. It's in all of your OpenWRT installations, whether you've turned it on or not, and I think most of you have. And that's basically a combination of the CODEL controlled delay active queue management with flow isolation using a variant of dynamic round robin or deficit round robin. And that's usually combined with the hierarchical token bucket, which has become the de facto standard shaper. Although some people like to use the hierarchical fair service curve instead because they're masochists. But um, both HTTP and HFSC are hierarchical complex shapers designed for big applications, big routers, desktop class CPUs, or maybe a PowerPC high-end embedded CPU. And the combination of these two things, which usually involves some classification as, as well, it requires expert setup to get right, to make it work properly. Now, I can do that. Probably most of you can do that, or at least figure out how to. And big vendors tend to get it wrong. It's sufficiently complex that every Pretty much every commercial product at the c consumer level that we've tried that has these QoS features, they've got it wrong and it doesn't work. So one of Cake's aims <coughs> is to make it simpler so that even the big vendors can get it right, as well as making it easier for you and me. So, the active queue management, probably many of you know what it is already. Show of hands, how many do you know what AQM means? Okay, not all that many of you. So, you know the term buffer bloat. How many of you do know the term buffer bloat? Good. A bigger number. Mm. OK, well, active queue management is the basic solution to buffer bloat. When you have an unmanaged queue, you get large delays, routinely of several seconds, and occasionally several minutes, which we call interplanetary latency. Because it takes several minutes for your signal to get to Mars, and several minutes to get back. 
Why does she feel like Yeah. <laughs> but it's not the sort of thing you expect while you're to see while you're still firmly planted on Earth, or even flying a few thousand meters above the Earth. And yet we do, because some hardware vendor has put big unmanaged buffers in their devices and completely failed to consider what effect that might have on real world traffic. So AQM keeps the queue length thought short by choosing when to mark packets or drop them in order to tell the endpoints that in fact the link is congested and that they should slow down a little bit to let other traffic through. So the point of AQM is to minimize the induced delay under load and we routinely achieve about 10 milliseconds of induced latency within the flow just with AQM. So what do we get with our AQM? We get this um, cumulative probability chart. And you can see that some of these things are going up into the seconds. And this is on Wi-Fi. This is a single Wi-Fi hop. And we're seeing latencies of up to 3,000 seconds at the less than 90% probability. So when we go over 90%, we see even bigger numbers, or even packets that are lost at the tail and have to be retransmitted. And when packets are lost at the tail of an unmanaged queue, they tend to be lost in bursts. So we need lots of retransmissions, and TCP does not like that. It reacts very badly. We can also see a correlation between the available bandwidth and the latency that is induced. So in the first couple of columns, we see relatively low latency and relatively, well, relatively low bandwidth and relatively high latency. On the next two, we see relatively high bandwidth and relatively low latency. And that's because the length of the queue is fixed in the hardware. Because it's unmanaged, it takes longer to drain the clue when, queue when there is less bandwidth through which you are doing so. And Wi-Fi link, its bandwidth changes a lot. It goes up and down, more or less at random. But the queue length remains fixed. AQM can help with that if it's a good AQM. It counts in terms of time instead of in bytes. And with such an AQM, Codel, look at the scale on the right-hand side. With the peaks are only about three milliseconds. Not three seconds, three milliseconds. That's a big difference. You won't notice that. Not even if you're on the phone with your sister through that link. Three milliseconds is nothing. We'd like to do even better, but three milliseconds is good. The next feature of FQ Cotel, which Cake has inherited, is flow isolation, which most people call fair queuing. But fair queuing has a particular meaning in the academic literature, so we use flow isolation instead. And Cake began with FQ Cordell as a core, so it has inherited this feature. It's inherited the deficit round robin variant. But we now use set associative hashing. See, one problem with uh, normal implementations of flow isolation is they use a hash function to decide which queue needs to, a particular packet needs to go into. How many of you have heard of the birthday theorem? Okay, so more than half of you have studied statistics. Can you please repeat, it means the birthday? 
the birthday theorem. So it means that... Mm. <laughs> well, basically, if you have a, a hash table with n entries, um, and you have two items that need to go into, well, you have a number of items which need to go into that hash table. When the number of items equals the square root of the number of buckets in the hash table, then you have a 50% chance of at least one hash collision. And this is an ideal situation when you have a perfect hash function. And hash functions that we actually use are not perfect. So we've been seeing with our thousand queues in FQ Codel, we've been seeing quite routinely hash collisions when we have only a dozen flows or even less than that. And this is the difference that it makes. The dotted line is what happens. This is what uh, AQM is achieving by itself. So this is the, the induced latency that, a fl that two flows that, are, that have hash collided into the same bucket will see. And it's in the region of 30 milliseconds peak when the, late, when the bandwidth is low. This is not so good. It's not disastrous, but it's not so good. We'd like to do better. The solid red line right at the bottom, however, is what happens to a flow that is not in the same bucket that has not collided. And you can see that it's down below three milliseconds again. It's much better. So this is the benefit that flow isolation gives you and which the set associative hash that Cake has almost guarantees that you will get. We have almost eliminated the hash collision problem. We can only induce it with something like 200 flows, or if we're really unlucky, 50. And 50 flows is quite a heavy load. So, how many of you actively use diffserve? Yeah. Almost nobody. And that's because diffserve is a pretty um, odd spec. It's been rather loosely specified. There is no uh, reference implementation, even though it's an IETF standards track, what's it? I thought IETF standards track things were supposed to have working code. Apparently not. It, but implementing diffserve turns out to be difficult, at least as specified. So I decided to ignore the specification and do it the, the way that made sense. So a feature inherited from uh, FQ Cardell is the deficit round robin, and that automatically promotes sparse flows with the observation that most latency sensitive traffic, such as VOIP, is sparse. We contrast that with a bulk flow like a TCP uh, downloading your uh, Linux ISO or even BitTorrent. So Deficit round robin gives you most of what you need. <coughs> With diffserv, we uh, Cake's version of diffserv gives you a way to do priority without strict priority, which can lead to starvation, and with soft admission control, which is another guard against starvation. 
as other devices in your network might not be quite so intelligent as Cake is at avoiding strict priority. The way the soft admission control works is that there is a bandwidth threshold. Below that threshold, the class will get high priority. Above that threshold, it will get low priority. <coughs> so it's self-correcting, and traffic is given the incentive to choose the correct traffic class, the correct diff serve code point. So you, will own, you, you can't just set the highest priority available and expect to drown out all the other traffic. If you do that, you'll only get a quarter of the available traffic as long as there's something else competing with you. So we think this is a, uh, a step forward that might actually let people use DiffServe without having a degree in network engineering or a highly paid consultant setting your network up. And the bandwidth threshold is set according to the overall bandwidth, which Cake knows, but most other Q disciplines do not. And the reason why Cake knows it is because it has a built-in shaper. We can use the shaper for several different things. Most important, we can take control of the queue away from the hardware, because the hardware tends to have these unmanaged buffers in it, and no obvious way to take, to add intelligence to them. And these are ten tend to be quite large unmanaged buffers. And they may even be in a different device. So if you have a wireless router, and a cable modem, but the cable modem tends to be a black box. You can't change it, but you can add cake to the wireless router. So you can take control of the queue at the wireless router and prevent the queue in the cable modem from filling up. It's the same with the wireless Wi-Fi chipset. That has its own complex series of unmanaged queues. And I've also heard from several different people here about problems with the hidden node problem and how often stations can drown each other out and lead to congestion collapse simply because the network, network is fully loaded. So if you're running into that problem and you don't have a better solution yet, you can work around it by simply limiting the channel utilization. Set a limit on how much traffic is sent by any given node and reduce the airtime consumed by that node and giving space for other nodes to work in. Now, we have to compare that with HTB. Now, Cake's Shaper works in deficit mode, whereas a standard token bucket. How many of you learned about token buckets at, at school? <laughs> Usually it's an undergraduate level subject. <laughs> But, <laughs> OK, the, the token bucket um, is basically a leaky bucket uh, thing. You have a bucket full of tokens, and it, the tokens are fed in at a given amount. And if there's a token available, you can take it and send your traffic. If there's no tokens available, then you have to wait. So this is a credit mode system. If the bucket gets full because the link has been idle, you're able to send a big burst all at once. Where does that burst end up? In the dumb queue. 
immediately downstream of you. This is not what we want. <coughs> so Cake Shaper works in deficit mode. It will only burst if, for some CPU scheduling reason or the limited resolution of your timer, it has it only bursts as much as it has to, absolutely minimal. So this minimizes the amount of traffic that collects in the dumb queue. Additionally, because it's built in to cake and not a separate queue disk, there is no longer this single packet <coughs> standing queue between where the flow isolation happens and the AQM and the shaper. This accounts for a millisecond and a half at one megabit per second. Or is it at 10 megabits per second? 10. So even at 10 megabits per second, which is fairly substantial, we're saving a millisecond and a half, and we're already down at three milliseconds. So that's a 50% saving. It's important. Now, slightly less relevant to Wi-Fi, but we threw it in. <coughs> Overhead compensation. The IP packet is encapsulated for the link layer. So we have the Ethernet frame. We have the PPP framing. We have ATM cell quantization on ADSL. And on Wi-Fi, we have the pre and post amble of the radio itself. Now, Cake can account for the first three of these. It doesn't yet have a proper accounting of the RF stuff. We need tighter integration with the Wi-Fi stack for that. We haven't quite got that yet, but we're planning it, and eventually it will. In the meantime, for your uplink to the actual internet, you can turn these on, and you can then set your shaper closer to the Closer to, closer to the actual link rate that you have to the internet than you could with a standard token bucket filter without inducing latency. A further benefit of tight integration is that it is fast. Now, there. Archer C7 is a pretty standard piece of hardware inside, something like a 300, 400 megahertz MIPS processor. Hmm? OK, a few hundred megahertz MIPS processor. And if you set, use your standard setup of hierarchical token bucket and FQ CODL, it won't do 100 megabits per second. It just can't keep up. The CPU is too slow. And HTB is doing too many calculations in an inefficient way. Install Cake, however, and it can. 115 megabits per second no problem. The latency there is steady at about uh, four and a quarter milliseconds. And the bandwidth is perfectly steady at 115 megabits per second. And there's also 12 megabits per second coming in the opposite direction. You can, you can just see as the green line at the bottom of the graph. So cake is more efficient. You can get more out of your 
low-end consumer hardware. Something like that. And you're doing the third form. And you're doing steady 100. Have I understood right? You're doing steady 100 megabits yeah. on that thing. Yes. And um, so you've disabled NAS, disabled everything, there's no firewall? <laughs> no, this is with NAT. <laughs> there isn't one. The, there isn't one. This is, we, we have actually done this. In fact, we can probably demonstrate it, <laughs> if you really want. <laughs> yeah? Why not? Yeah? Why not try it? Are you going to try it? I mean, we can probably demonstrate it. Yeah, <laughs> Just not, not right here, right now. The hardware's over there somewhere. <laughs> but it will do that much. And given beefier hardware, like the uh, 1.2 gigahertz dual core in, the, in that particular nice piece of hardware, it'll do over 300 megabits per second. And this is still consumer-grade hardware. It's just a particularly good example of it. And this is uh, particularly important because some modern internet connections are actually capable of giving you that much data. And we're not just talking about fiber. Some of the newer cable connections are rated that high. So, it can do that because it uses less CPU per packet than HTB. And we're talking about just HTB. And Cake does everything else as well. It doesn't just do shaping. It also does the flow isolation. It also does the priority queuing. It has the, all of the bells and whistles in one package. And it, does, and it does this with less CPU than just a shaper. So we're quite proud of that. No compromise is required. It does it all, and it even does it with less memory, because we don't have multiple queues, uh, which each require their own FQ codel. Eight hundred two point eleven e. How many of you know what that means? Oh, right. Is this the wireless multimeter extension? More or less. It's basically hardware diffserve. It's hardware implementation of diffserve, which doesn't work. Yeah. So we basically ignore the existence of 802.11e and do it properly instead. This is what the priority queue is all about. Um, but what 802.11e consumes is its own buffer allocation for each of the four queues, bulk, best effort, video, and voice. We don't have those. We just have one. I'm not sure you can do the same job as h 11 e in a local, uh, local computer, because E is about prioritization between different nodes, giving your node sending high priority traffic a slightly higher chance to get to the medium than the other node sending low priority traffic. So right. shape prioritization of low traffic coming out of a single node Right. So aside from the four different queues, 802.11e also specifies these 
changes in the uh, inter-packet gap, which is their implementation of priority on the shared medium between different nodes. <coughs> and we let that happen. So if the hardware does that, we let it happen. But we basically keep those four hardware queues empty. So, no, Yes, and that's the responsibility of the device driver. So we don't interfere with the device driver. We just keep the queues empty as far as we can. So, but those queues can be smaller. Since they are kept empty, they consume less memory. And that means less latency. And because we are doing the priority queuing ourselves within the node, we avoid strict priority, and we avoid starvation. We don't allow a voice, a, someone who's picked a voice grade diff serve code point from starving everyone else. So if you consider a denial of service to be a security problem, which you should, this is a security benefit. Now, I said earlier that vendors tended to get things wrong. One big advantage of the deficit mode shaper is that it does not need to be tuned. With the token bucket, you have to tune the, bursts, the bucket size for how much, how big a burst you allow. You have to tune all sorts of things, and that is a bit ever prone. Because the deficit mode shaper always bursts only as much as it needs, it does not need that to be configured. So, things like that, bit of auto tuning in other places, and we only need to specify the bandwidth. And you can even la leave that out if you don't want to use the shaper. It'll default to unlimited mode, and it will do what it can with just the link rate. Some of its decisions will be a little less intelligent if it doesn't know the link rate, but it will still work. Yeah. We'd certainly like that, and we're working towards it. Um, again, we need tighter integration with the Wi-Fi stack in order to do the best possible job on Wi-Fi. So, future work. It is in the plan. Have you installed Cake yet? <laughs> Have you installed Cake yet? Oh, I need to install. <laughs> it does help. Very well. Give us some texture, dude. <laughs> but you can, you can change the parameters on the fly as well without losing packets. And this is useful when you want to run research. We've seen this graph before. And we can see that the bandwidth is changing. The green is the throughput. And some parts of it are high, some parts of it are low. The high parts are around 16 megabits per second, and the low parts are around 4. And you can see how the AQM with the dotted red line is controlling the Q it's a little bit looser when there is less bandwidth to work with, but it is still managing it. 
and when we, there is more bandwidth available, it brings it down to around 10 milliseconds. This is good. And the red line we can also see goes up and down a bit when the bandwidth changes. And the reason for that is simply how long it takes to send a single packet on the wire. So when you have only four megabits a second to deal with, then it takes several milliseconds, maybe two or three milliseconds, to send a full, size, a full MTU packet on the wire. And that is effectively what you're seeing in the sawtooth pattern of the red line. It jumps up when the probe packet happens to come in just behind a packet that has just been committed to the wire. And it drops down a bit, quite considerably, uh, when it arrives just before the packet has been, the other competing packet has been sent. So, that red line is about as good as we can do. When we have lower bandwidth, the only way we can do better is to use smaller packets, which hurts efficiency. So, we've even taken into account that most people don't really know about the further encapsulation of IP, so we've given them a few shortcuts for typical use cases. So some ADSL ISPs are relatively efficient and use PPP over ATM and the VC MUX, and it only takes 10 bytes of bandwidth of overhead. And the ATM flag gives us the compensation for the ATM cell quantization. Basically, you have to use an entire 53-byte ATM cell in order to send up to 48 bytes of payload. And a lazy ISP will stick with the early deployment options of BPP over Ethernet and LLC SNAP which I've forgotten what it stands for, and you probably don't care. 40 bytes of overhead per packet. On small packets, that's almost doubling the size. So we do need to account for that. And VDSL, which is used for your fiber to the cabinet stuff, we have shortcuts for that too, since they're getting increasingly popular. You can specify the overhead manually if you want. So we have an efficient shaper. We have diff serve support. It does everything that FQ Codel does better. And it's, it works. I use it every day. Basically, it saves my sanity when I'm running on a, um, a distant 3G link. <laughs> when you only have one megabit to work with, you really, really do need to manage it carefully. So it is still being improved. There are plans to add integration with the Wi-Fi stack. There are plans to give you uh, per host isolation, host isolation as well as flow isolation. So when you have lots of different people sharing the same link, we don't have people hogging it by accident <laughs> just because they're using a large number of flows. BitTorrent, anyone. 
Next question is, how do you get hold of it? Well, here are some URLs. The, the latest version is out of tree as a kernel module. You also need a patched IP route too to understand how to configure it and the, get the statistics out of it. There's a lot of statistics. And it's also available as OpenWRT packages. If you want to experiment with it on your cheap consumer routers. And all of these will, yeah, the presentation will be uploaded. So you can look at these at your leisure. OK, do we have any questions? Of course we do. When we've stabilized the interface better, we will. Uh, when it comes to estimating uh, available bandwidth on uh, wireless things, for now, all I've found, always I found the Dreamland work by like, regularly polling the list of uh, wireless peers and getting this uh, newly introduced estimated throughput field, which I see uh, the two problems in there. First of all, it has to be called, it's not the event based. Yes, so for that we need the integration with Minstrel and the rest of the wireless stack, which we don't have yet. Um, I think there are still some changes to the wireless stack needed to expose that sort of interface. We're working towards it. It's part of the Make Wi-Fi Fast project, which I think we'll hear about tomorrow. Saturday. Saturday, okay. Right. Now, Keg does deliver single packets to the uh, device's queues, but it does so at a steady rate. So if there is a gap between transmit opportunities, then packets will build up in the device's queue and aggregation will be possible. So that naturally works at the moment. It's not as good as it could be, Again, we need tighter integration, but it does, it's not automatically inefficient. Anyone else, or should I hand over to Dave? All right. Thank you for listening.